Good morning, church family. Welcome to church this morning. Um, we're opening with a song, The Lion and the Lamb, and I was looking into, um, you know, introducing it and kind of teaching what it means, and then I opened my Bible to Revelation 5, which it's based on, and I thought, I need to go to seminary. I cannot talk about this. This is very complex. So we're not going to talk about Revelation 5 today, but what this song reminds me of is that our Jesus is victorious, and that led me to 1 Corinthians 15, 55, and 56, and 57. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So let us sing to our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the lion and the lamb, and he is the victor. Would you stand and sing with us?
can stop the Lord Almighty? The answer is no one. No one. Our God is great. praise you. You are greater than we can have words to express and greater than our imagine can even fathom. It's our imagination. And so Jesus, we praise you. You've given us everything we have. You are our savior. And we lift our voices to you. Savior 
doesn't stain. He washes me. Good morning. First of all, thank you to the praise team for um, this beautiful start, and thank you especially for singing one of my favorite all-time hymns, How Great Thou Art. What a, what a wonderful hymn it is, and how uplifting, so thank you. Um, welcome, everyone, and uh, whether you're in person here or online, uh, welcome, and we hope you are blessed today. If you're uh, new here or relatively new, uh, we ask that you also be very blessed by being here and made to feel welcome. And uh, we invite you to stay for a cup of coffee and some fellowship in the fellowship hall right outside the sanctuary after the service. May I now lead you in congregational prayer. Our Heavenly Father, creator of all things, eternal King, we come before you this morning acknowledging you as our Savior and the Lord of our lives, in every aspect. You are the great I am, the one who changes us but never changes. You have appointed all the days of each of our lives and you know us intimately. You loved us before we even knew you and we thank you and praise you that you have made a way for us to be with you forever. Father, may our lives be about advancing your kingdom. May we live in such a way that we are walking, talking advertisements for your love. Forgive us, Lord, when our lives are so much less than that, when we get too focused on earthly things, when we worry instead of living in faith. We are prone to be selfish people, Lord, seeking our own needs and desires first. We ask for forgiveness for our sins, Lord, individually and as a church, for hurtful things we have done, for loving things we have left undone. 
May we be open to your Spirit's leading, Lord, to show us a better way. And may we look to Jesus as our example. We ask for your blessing on all, all, on all the ministries of this church, Lord. We pray, Lord, for the leaders and volunteers. Give us all a passion for our work. May it always be our desire to glorify you. Protect us from burnout, from any selfish motivation, or impatience with others whose passions lie elsewhere. Help us to be encouraging and supportive of each other in the ways we serve. Help us to be a well-functioning body, respectful and thankful for all the different parts. Be with our life groups and life group leaders. May we help one another grow through our studies and give encouragement as we walk alongside each other. We ask that you will bless the Brazil team as we prepare to serve at Chain of Love. We trust you, Father, to provide everything that is needed, and we ask that you bless the work done there. Be with our pastors and staff. Bless Pastor Darren as he leads a Focus 3 team on a retreat, and bless each one of those members of the team. Bless Pastor Darren's studies, and give him wisdom and compassion as he leads our church. We thank you for his leadership. Bless Pastor Bonnie on her sabbatical, Lord. Thank you that she successfully completed her studies, and we pray that you give her a time of rest and refreshing. Be with Pastor Gord as he brings your word this morning. Thank you for his ministry among the seniors as he brings words of encouragement. Please continue to be with Pastor Ben as he leads our youth. Bless their small, study, small group studies and the events that he has planned. Be with Pastor Jamal as he continues to work with us, search out ways um, to reach out into our community and to minister among us. Be with Pastor Nelson as he also works among us. Thank you for the trip to Kenya that he was able to make, along with Ross Hanna and Shirley Keller. We pray, Lord, that the trip was insightful and encouraging. We thank you for the work of Antoinette with our children, which she does with such obvious enthusiasm. We thank you for the interns she was able to get to help her with the numerous plans she has for this summer. Lord, we also ask that you be with each staff member as they serve you in this congregation and contribute to the well-being and smooth operation of our church. Dear Lord, there are needs in our congregation, both known to us and unknown, but you, Lord, you know them all. We ask for those who are hurting, Lord. We pray for those who are sick, some of whom have long-term chronic conditions, some who are experiencing a lot of pain. We ask for your healing hand upon them, and we ask for a special measure of strength and grace for them to be able to bear the pain, the isolation, the things that come with being ill. May they be very aware of your loving presence, and may it provide great comfort. We pray for those who are struggling with work, Father, be it the lack of work or trying situations in their work. Lord, open doors, we pray, for those who are seeking work. We pray for those who are struggling in relationships, whatever the relationship may be, spouses, parent, child, siblings, co-workers, or brothers and sisters in Christ. We ask for conciliatory, humble hearts and forgiving spirits and openness to your spirit's guidance. Father, it is so obvious when we look around and listen to the news that we live in a very broken world. We pray for peace in the Ukraine. We pray, we pray for those who have fled and are fleeing that they may find safe, safe refuge. We pray for the organizations who are helping them and for those who have opened their homes. Lord, we hear of revival in the churches in Ukraine and we pray that as the refugees are being, dis, are being dispersed, so too a renewed commitment to and love for you may be spread through them. Lord, may we all find ways to be salt and light in a world badly needing preservation and illumination. We thank you for the joys in our congregation, for expectant moms, for those who have been moved to baptism and membership, for joy-giving connections being made, and for new opportunities. Sometimes it isn't until after the fact that we see how your hand has been working in our lives. Help us to be more fully aware of how you are shaping our lives in our times of joy and also in our times of trouble. Father, we profoundly thank you for your love, that we are privileged to be your children, and as such that we can bring all our concerns and cares to you, knowing you hear us and are willing and able to do all we ask and even more. Help us to rest in your love through Christ alone. Amen. 
So there's some announcements um, that I've been asked to make. Um, if you are a visitor with us today, we would like to welcome you and invite you to fill out a connection card found in the seat back pocket in front of you. Please drop it off at the Welcome Centre in the lobby after the service. There will be someone available there to answer any questions you may have. We would also like visitors well, we would also like to welcome any visitors worshiping, worshiping with us online this morning. Please check out our website at shbc.ca or contact the church office during the week if you would like more information about the church. All seniors are invited for a time of fellowship this coming Friday, May 27th, from 1.30 to 4 p.m. in the church lobby. This will be a wonderful chance to connect with other seniors in our church family. We'd like to invite everyone to our annual vision night on Tuesday, May 31st, from 7 to 8.30. Put it on your calendars. This is an opportunity to hear about what we are looking forward to in the next ministry year. The membership will be reviewing and seeking approval for our annual ministry plans and budget for the next year. All attenders of SHBC are welcome to join the meeting. A copy of the AGM report has been emailed out. Copies are also available at the Welcome Center. This meeting will be in-person only and will not be offered online. Childcare will be provided. Please be in prayer for this meeting also. We will be having a memorial service for Walter and Esther Gnida on Saturday, June 4th at 1 p.m. The family would like to invite everyone from the church to attend the service and luncheon to follow. We are in need of volunteers to help serve the catered lunch. If you are available to help, please sign up at the Welcome Center. For more information, please contact Pastor Darren. And now if I could lead you in a prayer for the offering. Heavenly Father, as we bring our gifts to you now, we thank you for all you have given us. We acknowledge you as the giver of all good gifts, and we praise you for your generosity to us. May our offerings be pleasing to you, and may they be used in a stewardly fashion for the furtherance of your kingdom. Amen. I was going to invite the uh, ushers up. It looks like there's a few of them. So we'll have the ushers come forward, and um, I'll do some talking while they're passing the plates. As Helen was praying, there's been two missions teams this spring and summer. The team from Kenya, Nels, Pastor Nelson finally arrived home last night. They went a few weeks ago, and the team is going to Brazil on June 9th. Um, there's still plenty of days to sign up on the prayer calendar for the Brazil team, so if you'd like to pray for them and get emails while they're away, um, please sign up at the display in the back. And as for Kenya, um, my husband Ross was there, and he showed me a video that I'm going to share with you today. They met a group of 100 kids, the kids you'll see in the video. All of them have lost one or both parents in the conflict in Congo, and they're being cared for by family members in that community where they visited. Um, so Ross showed me the video and suggested that we sing with them someday. So today's the day we're going to sing with these kids. The words they are singing are, You are Yahweh, Alpha and Omega. You are Yahweh, Alpha and Omega. You are Yahweh, you are Yahweh, you are Yahweh, you are Yahweh. So let's play the video.
Good morning, Steel Heights. Good morning to those of you who are worshiping online. Thank you so much for joining us. We do pray that you would sense God's presence in this place and that you would find encouragement and hope through your worship. Yahweh, Yahweh, of course, is the name that God revealed to Moses at the burning bush, uh, which means I am that I am, and it's often translated throughout Scripture just as Lord. When Lord is in all four capitals, it's referring to the name of Yahweh. He is the beginning and the end, the ever-living one, Yahweh. Well, a week from today, those of you who know I'm kind of semi-retired, and uh, each summer, Debbie and I, we head east, of course, to, uh, for several different reasons, and this is kind of my last week, or actually I'll be here next Sunday morning, and then right after church, pointing the car east and taking that long drive. Now, why am I doing that? I could give you a thousand different reasons. I'll, I'll give you just two. This is one of them right here. <clears throat> so this is my sixth granddaughter. Her name is Juliet, and she was born on January the 15th, just of this year. And uh, when I saw her in February, her eyes were closed, and now I'll get to see her with her eyes all open. Now her big sister, because Rebecca has five, her big sister is Annabelle, and I'm having the pleasure of baptizing Annabelle on June the 12th. Uh, in Moncton. So when I was there in February, we went off to run an errand together uh, at Costco. And when she got in the car, the only thing she wanted to talk to was talk about was baptism. Crampy, I need to be baptized. And so I quizzed her and, uh, and very deeply, like, you know, I got a pastor's heart. <laughs> and her... Uh, her uh, pastor at Moncton sent me an email and asked me if I was available to baptize her. Mom and dad are celebrating their 66th wedding anniversary on June the 2nd, and that's the day that the, hopefully the car will arrive uh, in Moncton. And so we have uh, lots of things that uh, we are celebrating but we're turning now to uh, Hebrews chapter 12, and let me just give you the background once again as we've been going through this series in the book of Hebrews. And of course, the writer to the Hebrews, at that time, uh, these uh, Jewish Christians, there was a lot of uh, adversary, ad adversity, a lot of trials, tribulations, and they were adding things to their faith. They were adding things to Christ. And the writer says, you don't need to add anything. Christ is supreme. He's sufficient. Don't fall away. And he's encouraging them not to fall away. And in this chapter, uh, which is the chapter of running with endurance. Now I'm going to read just 12, maybe 13 verses, if you will follow along. And this is in the New Living Translation today. So again, the background, Hebrews chapter 11 is the Faith Hall of Fame, where all of the people of faith in the Old Testament are listed, Moses and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Enoch and Samson, all these people, their faith, they have gone through it before. And they're encouraging us, and we're taking that up at verse 1 in chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily hinders our progress, and let us run the race with endurance that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, who is on whom our faith depends from start to finish. 
He was willing to die a shameful death on the cross because of the joy he knew would be his afterward. Now he is seated in a place of highest honor beside God's throne in heaven. Think about all he endured when sinful people did such terrible things to him so that you don't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. And have you entirely forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you through his children? He said, my child, don't ignore it when the Lord disciplines you. And don't be discouraged when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those whom he loves, and he punishes those he accepts as his children. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Whoever heard of a child who was never disciplined, if God doesn't discipline you as he does all his children, it means that you're actually illegitimate and you're not really his children after all. Since we respect our earthly fathers who disciplined us, should we not all the more more cheerfully submit to the discipline of our heavenly father and live forever? For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best that they knew how. But God's discipline is always right and good for us because it means that we will share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful. But afterwards, there is a quiet harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. So, take a new grip with your tired hands and stand firm on your shaky legs. Mark out a straight path for your feet. And then those who follow you, though they are weak and lame, will not stumble and fall, but will become strong. Let's pray. Oh God, this is your word. Who am I? Lord, may I get out of the way uh, this morning. May your spirit take your truth and Lord, apply it to each individual person and their circumstances here. May we be lifted up in such a way and filled with you and your truth that we would go out from this place and live our lives and that our light for you would burn brightly and shine new. Thank you for your word. We celebrate you. We celebrate your eternal word. Guide us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the Hebrew Christians in the early church, they've got it rough. And they feel like giving up. They feel like throwing in the towel. Does that connect with you in any way? What do you do when you feel like giving up? Everyone has had moments like that. Oh, I remember when I was in my young 20s and I figured I could handle anything that this world threw at me. And then there was life lessons where I was stripped and felt so weak and so naked before God and just cried out, oh, God, help me. Have you had a time as well where you felt like giving up? Of course you have. Maybe it was a difficult ministry experience. Maybe it was or is a health issue. Maybe it's a broken relationship. Maybe it's financial problems that are so overwhelming and burdening. Maybe it's a depression. 
It's that you start wondering with this life difficulty and circumstances, Lord, I, I can't see any light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, how do I take the next step? Well, if that's you at all this morning, or it has been you within the past, you will as well receive encouragement this morning from he Hebrews chapter 12. Because Hebrews 12 gives us two powerful reasons for us to keep on keeping on within the faith. Here's the first one. comes from the first verse. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses of life, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So what is the encouragement? What's it saying? It's saying that heaven is watching you. Heaven is not only watching you, and God is not only watching you, but he's cheering you on in the midst of of those challenges. And there's different times as I look at Hebrews chapter 11 and all those people, ordinary people of great faith in the faith hall of fame, as I think of their lives and I think of different times when I hit those speed bumps in life and I hear them going, go, Lord, go, you can do it. I have been there. And they cheer me on. And not only them, but people in my life that have passed on before me that are presently now, like those great cloud of witnesses, cheering me on within the faith. Lord, I've been there. Keep on keeping on, fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher and perfecter of our faith. Consider him who endured such hostility by sinners so that you will not grow weary and give up. See, there is a connection between being a Christian and endurance. The Apostle Paul writes that we show that we are God's servants by patiently enduring troubles, hardships, and difficulties. Well, what does that say when we feel like giving up? Well, it says then we must be far away from God. We must be trusting in ourselves at that moment instead of him because God wants us to patiently endure those troubles, trials, and difficulties. Paul also writes to his brother Timothy, and he says, Timothy, you know about my endurance. In fact, all of us, we could look up in 2 Corinthians 11 and see a whole chapter of all of Paul's challenges, of his beatings, of his stonings, of his whippings, of his shipwrecks, of his jailings, all of the things. I mean, just within my own human spirit, just re I, I would just get more depressed and more depressed and more of all the things that he went through. And yet, look what Paul, he never gave up, as in the New Century Version says, Timothy, you know I never give up. Or as he would say in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Developing endurance. And so these early Christians, the writer of the Hebrews, he's trying to encourage them because their knees are weak. They're ready to fall away. And he is encouraging them to keep on keeping on. How do we do that? What do we do when we feel like giving up? Well, let's take a look at six Things that we learned from the people in chapter 11 of some of the things that they did to help them persevere within their faith. And the first one is to embrace God's greater plan because usually when we're going through the trial, I mean, we've got blinders on, right? When we're going through the trial, we just see a narrow tunnel. That's all that we see. We just see our story, the lower story, 
not realizing that there's an upper story, that God has a plan and a purpose for what's going on. Embrace God's greater plan. Probably one of the hardest uh, moves uh, that my family experienced in 2002, and we were moving from uh, Fredericton to Moncton, and this was a tender age, especially for Rebecca and Raquel, daughters one and three. And Raquel was in grade five, and Rebecca was in grade nine. Those are tender years, and all of a sudden, after eight years, Daddy comes home and says, we're moving. I mean, there was crying, there was weeping, there was gnashing of teeth. I don't want to go. I don't want to lose my friends. And, And it was hard for them. We moved to Moncton two years later. Raquel is now in grade seven. And Rebecca's in grade 11. And actually, in those two years, there was so many wonderful experiences that happened to our family that my little daughter said to me, I'll never forget her words. She said, Daddy, God must have known what he was doing. (laughs) Because we wouldn't have experienced any of these great things if we'd have stayed in Fredericton, because they were very unique to Moncton. And I went, wow, what a great lesson. Do you think I would have learned that lesson? Let's fast forward to 2015. When I get the posting message that says, the military is moving me to Edmonton. What? I don't want to leave the Maritimes. And I came Kicking and screaming, God, are you sure you know I don't want to go to Edmonton? And yet, from all the supports that we have received for our family, especially our two wheelchair children and our friends and the church that we have here, Edmonton has become the best thing that has ever happened to us. Embrace God's greater plan. In the here and now, in the heat of the moment, within the fire, it's sometimes hard to see. Because when we look at those experiences, those, those problems and difficulties, when we, when we don't see behind those circumstances the bigger picture, that's when we collapse. And so we need to embrace God's greater plan. Peter writes to the church and he says, these trials are only to test your faith, to show that it is strong and pure. It's, that is, your faith is being tested as fire purifies gold. Your faith is so much more precious to God than gold. In fact, God's purpose behind your problems is always greater than any problem that you're going to go through. There is a greater plan. There is a bigger plan. And we need to trust in God. In fact, James says that you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Endure until your testing is over, and then you will be mature and complete and won't lack anything. And so here we see a connection between our own Christian maturity and the trials that we go through. Christian maturity comes from learning to endure trials and temptations and testing. Christian maturity comes from learning to endure delays and difficulties and dead ends in life. When we throw up our hands and we say, oh, well, what now? Trust God's greater plan. A second thing that we can do in developing endurance is to nurture your spiritual roots. To nurture, Jesus said there are four kinds of hearts. He explained this in the parable of the good soil, the parable of the soils. He says there's a hard heart, a heart that's so hard that the word of God can't even get into it. It's packed so hard. There's thorny hearts, there's shallow hearts, and there's fertile hearts. And Jesus said in Mark chapter 4, some people don't have any roots. So, as soon as life gets hard, as soon as troubles come, they give up. So, a second key to enduring 
problems within your life, difficulties in your life, is you have to develop spiritual roots. It's called discipleship. And it is a lifelong process of being a disciple and learning from Christ. The secret is being rooted in him, Colossians 2, 7. Be rooted and built up in Christ and established within your faith. No matter what the circumstances, you need to nurture your spiritual roots and to hold on to the word of God. Did you know that the Bible was actually written to teach you endurance and to give you encouragement? That's what Paul says in Romans 15. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement that they, that is the encouragement that scriptures provide, we might have hope. Circumstances are always changing. Our culture is always changing. Public opinion is always changing. But the word of God stands forever. It is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when you build your life on something that doesn't change, that's the only time stability is going to come. Build your life on the word of God. Embrace God's greater plan. Nurture your spiritual roots. Direct your attention towards Christ. Because if you take your eyes off Christ on the world, you look at the world today, if you look at the world, you're going to be distressed. If you look inside yourselves all the time, you're going to be depressed. But if you look at Christ, you will be at rest because he is sovereign and he's in complete control. It all depends of what you have your eyes on. You can have your eyes on your problems or you can have your eyes on the solution. And the solution is always Jesus. In fact, there was a song back in 1973, Andre Crouch. I don't even know. Some of you might remember it. How did it go? Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other, Jesus is the way. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other, Jesus is the way. Don't focus on your circumstances. Don't focus on the problems. Focus on the answer, and Jesus is the answer. The more that you look at God, the smaller your problems will seem. But the more that you stare at your problems, <laughs> the bigger you're going to think they are, right? So it's what is your focus? And in the book of Hebrews, there's this constant theme about fixing your eyes or focusing on the object of our faith. And that's what it says in the next verse. It says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher the author and perfecter of our faith. Fix your eyes on him who for the joy of the Lord, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. What? That doesn't sound right. Jesus thought going to the cross was joy? Like is he a sadist or something? No, no, you're looking at the wrong. He's not looking at the pain. He's looking at the result. It's the same way as a new mother, you know, an expectant mother doesn't say, well, I just can't wait until all that pain comes. Oh, boy, it's going to be so much fun and joy. Not at all. They're thinking of the baby, that new life, that miracle that they have. And so there's great joy in that event as they focus on. And Jesus in the same way. He says, for who the joy that was set before him 
endured the cross. So there's this fixing your eyes on Jesus. Back actually several weeks ago when I preached on Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, it said the same thing. It said, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and our high priest. Here it says, as the author and finisher of our faith. But the verb is still the same, to fix your eyes on the solution, not on the problems, but fix your eyes on Jesus. And then the next verse, in Hebrews 12, verse 2, and then verse 3, it says, Consider him. Here's another word that the writer of Hebrews uses maybe six or seven different times where it says, just let your mind ponder. Other translation says, think about him. The NASB says, consider him who endured such opposition from sinful people so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. See, it's what we put our direction, our focus, or our attention on. Developing endurance, we can also use, come on, flicker, fifth, sixth time, seventh time, there it is. (laughs) Use your experience to help others. Use your experience, even the pain, even something that, that's not a whole lot of fun going through at all. Use your experience to help others. So the Apostle Paul, in his second letter to the church in Corinth, he says, when we, saying the Apostle Paul, Silas, Barnabas, Luke, this is who he's talking about with we. When we are weighed down with troubles, it's for your benefit, O Corinthians. It's for your benefit and salvation. For when God comforts us, it's so that we in turn can be an encouragement to you. And then you can patiently endure the same things that we endure. Because the Apostle Paul did it for others. He was always focusing on others. Did you know that sometimes God puts you through some painful experiences, not for you, but for somebody else? Maybe your kids. Maybe your grandkids. But God says to you, He says, I want you to go through a difficult time. I want you to go through a period of darkness, a period of depression, a period of discouragement. And then God will comfort you so that you can turn around and comfort others with the very comfort that you've been given. In fact, our greatest life message always comes out of our weakness, not out of our strengths. The Apostle Paul says, when I'm weak, that's when I've come to understand how strong God is. In fact, who can better help somebody? Who can help someone who's recovering from alcoholism more than another alcoholic? Who can help someone that goes through the dreadful pain of a divorce except someone else who has lived through that and testifies of God's love and faithfulness and acceptance? Who can better help a parent who just had a child and was told that their child has Down syndrome than someone that comes alongside that already has a Down syndrome child and understands? One of the ways that we learn to endure is by refocusing off of ourselves, off of our pain, and to focus on how can we help others. Other things that we have learned from uh, Hebrews chapter 11 is to rely on God's power. I don't know what it is about this pride thing that often we feel like we can stand on our own two feet, that we can do it all on our own, that pride issue that gets, and I don't need to pray. I mean, I can look after this by myself or God is always trying to teach us to rely on him. And that passage in Ephesians 6, when he talks about putting on the full armor of God, just before that, in the verse before, in Ephesians 6, verse 10, it says, 
Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Don't be strong by yourself. You know how people say, well, you've got to have faith. That's what the world says, so you've got to have faith. But it, more importantly, is the object of our faith. It's what you have faith in. We need to have faith in Christ. And when it comes to our strength, we need to rely on God's strength. We'll never make it on our own strength. There's too many times where God will completely humble us and remind us of our frailty. You know, Gord, you just made of dust. You know, you weren't meant to take on all of this. You were meant to trust and depend upon me. Paul writes in Colossians, his glorious power will make you patient and strong enough to endure. His power, not mine. In Romans 12, 12, don't quit in hard times, but pray all the harder. Depend upon him. God says that he wants you to learn to trust him during those experiences. And you don't know that God is all you need until God is all you have. Well, the last one, there's probably many other practical things that we can do to grow in our endurance and perseverance, which so greatly honors God, right? You know, we're thinking about growing in endurance so that we can just get through it. Well, that's not the only motive. It should be, God, I want to, I want to glorify your name as I go through this and to be used by you. Well, lastly, expect God to bless you through that very, very dark time. Expect a blessing. Faith is expecting that God will do something in your life. And even Jesus said, according to your faith, be it done to you. Now, if you read between the lines in that verse like I have, it's that Jesus is saying that, we get to choose how much God helps us through our difficult times by how much we trust in him according to our faith. James writes, God blesses, expect God to bless you. God blesses the people who patiently endure testing. After it's over, they will receive the crown of life as promised to those who love him. Well, how are we going to finish this morning? What I want to do is I want to take the first verse and kind of marry it together with verse 12 or 13 in the scripture that we had read. I want you to see both of them together. Hebrews 1, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, so take a new grip with your tired hands and stand firm on your shaky legs and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Then those who follow you, though they are weak and lame, will not stumble and fall, but will become strong. So I've got two big reasons to keep on keeping on. One is heaven is watching. God is cheering me on. The people of faith before me, people within my family that know me, that have had a spiritual influence in my life, they're cheering me on. That's a great motivation. But secondly... How I respond to those trials is going to impact those around me. My kids, my grandkids, those who are watching when we go through challenges. And then those who follow you, though they are weak and lame, they will not stumble and fall, but will become strong. And as you live perseverance of faith, then you're going to have that opportunity to pass on that baton of the gospel to the next generation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you 
for the Lord Jesus. Lord, I don't know all the problems that people are going through today. I don't know all the difficulties that are in this church. You do. You know every heart, every person that is here, and you brought them here because you want them to find encouragement. The encouragement that comes from endurance, comes from your word, comes from your power, comes from your love. Lord, help us at all times to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter, the initiator and completer of our faith, O oh Lord. May we glorify him in the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Let's sing about trusting in God. Would you stand and sing? Letting go of every single dream. Lay each one down at your feet. Every moment of my wandering never changes what you see. Try to win this war, I confess. My hands are weary, I need your rest. Mighty warrior, king of the fight. No matter what I face, you're by my side. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could. benediction from Ephesians and number six. And now unto him who can do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine according to the power that works within us, even Christ himself. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's
face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance. May he smile upon you as he cheers you on as you live your life of faith for him. Both now and forevermore. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.